Welcome everybody. It's office hours time again. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully the stragglers that come in after nine o'clock my time will also be joining us. Uh, we've got a lot to get through tonight, so I'm not gonna sit here and banter for any length of time. I'm gonna get straight into sharing some slides because I've only got a brief role to play in tonight's office hours. Let me fire up my slide share. Okay, hopefully you can see that. As I said, getting in touch with me is always easy. Just head over to Linktree slash Connor, or if you're one of those new, cool, trendy people, just uh, scan the QR code, but let's jump into it. As I always do with Office Hours, I do a, a little bit of bits and pieces, things that have been happening, things that are coming up, etc. First thing I want to do is, those of you that flame me on Twitter because I didn't do an October Office Hours, like where was Office Hours, let me defend myself very briefly. I had the Autumn Tech Conference at UK OUG, gave a paper there. Then I had Ozug Connect, where I did a paper there. And then I had the Oracle Groundbreaker Tour, where we did four talks across Europe, all virtually. And then I did the keynote for the Latin American Oracle User Conference. Now I've just done the DOAG Conference, 25 years and hints and tips. And then we've done the APAC Groundbreaker Tour. I've done two talks already, got one again, I think, tomorrow. Database world has been going on, as you've probably seen, that was a very successful event for us. And we're doing the APAC version of that next week. I've got a talk there. And Sangam coming up in a week's time. So I've been prepping for that as well. And if you haven't been following the podcast, I did a good fun series of chats with Tim Hall, otherwise known as Oracle Base. So don't give me a hard time. I've been busy. That's why we had to uh, push off office hours. Also, it turned out that last month's office hours would have sat right on the same day, I think, as the database world. And uh, that would be what I call a career limiting move for me to compete against uh, the esteemed colleagues of mine inside Oracle. As I've been saying to any office hours, any talk I've done the last two years, it's great to have you on these virtual calls. I'm thrilled to have you here, but the reality is communities belong face to face. So please follow your local guidelines, your local laws, whatever they might be, Let's get ourselves vaccinated so our communities can be back. Now, normally when I get to this point in office hours, I put up this session and I have all the various topics and, and questions we're gonna talk about. None of that applies tonight, none indeed. Tonight is a very, very special session. And let me set the scene for you. What if we took two of the, probably the eminent testing authorities in the database community. What if we took them? What if we grabbed them off the street and kidnapped them? And not only we'd kidnap them, we did all the things that kidnappers would normally do. Hopefully this is not triggering anyone. Yeah, we would blindfold them so they can't see what's going on. And naturally, we would blindfold their accomplices as well. So yeah, there's no sneak peeking here. And we'd say, here's an application that you've never seen, never heard of, your job is to test it and find the problems. Now, I don't write many apps nowadays. I, I tinker a little bit in Apex and things like that. So I thought what I would do is an obvious application for me to write would be a question I, I'm like, ask Tom. And what do we do in Ask Tom? We display a list of questions. That's what we do. Questions come in, we display the questions. And when we look at each individual question, how do these questions come in? Well, people pose questions. They log questions in our database. And administrators like myself and Chris Saxon, we answer them. So we have questions and answers, sort of one of each. And then after those questions have been answered, we get feedback or comments. And comments and feedback pretty much work along the same line. We have community members, they'll pass us in some comments and we'll respond to those comments. And that's not necessarily a pairing as such. I can respond many times, they can respond many times. So that's just a continuous list of commentary that's attached to each individual question. So I thought, let's build an application which is Ask Tom Lite that just offers those basic services all in Peel SQL. So we don't have to worry about node and containers and all that kind of stuff to a very simple database application. So this is the data model that I thought I would build my application. And you can see at the top there, I know that it's data model of the font is infinitely small, but effectively we have a table of administrators and they sit over two tables, one being a table of questions. Questions come in from people with their name, their email, etc. And then we have feedback that also links back to admins because an admin person might log some feedback. And the feedback is linked to every single question. So a very simple three table data model. 
And this is what I built. And this is what I've sent to the two guys literally before this Zoom started. I said, here's my idea. Here's the data model. Here's the DDL. And we'll see the application in a second. That's what you're going to have to test. So the table of admins is pretty simple. We just have some basic information about an admin with a primary key. I put the normal things I would do in a data model, some primary keys, check constraints, etc. Then we have a table of questions. And the questions have an ID, the email, the name, the person that put them in, notify being a flag as to whether they want to be emailed when we've actually um, answered their question, the title of the question, the question itself, the answer that we provide, who provided it, the admin, whether it was me or Chris or whoever wants to be an administrator and ask Tom, the normal check constraints, et cetera, primary keys. And then we had feedback, which sits underneath questions. So feedback ID, the question ID being its parent, the email, the person that provided the feedback, or it might be me, the admin ID. So it's, it's either or, some various constraints, the normal kind of stuff. And there's pretty much our data model. In terms of the application, it's just one PL SQL package. We've only got an hour tonight. I didn't want to drown our poor testers with like 25,000 lines of code. So it's just one simple package. And what does it do? Well, it's got probably three core functions. One is some simple APIs to manage the administrators. We can add an admin, modify an admin like their name or their email address, and we can delete an admin. Then the two core things that the community would use, a new question. I want to log a new question. Someone comes in, yep, here's my question, and some new feedback. Both community members and admins would use new feedback because either of us can actually log feedback. And then this is sort of a rough idea of what the application would look like to the outside world. A question page, show me a page of questions starting, you know, a given page of questions and starting at an offset amount. Show me the questions for a particular customer. I might log in and say, here's my email address, show me all my questions. The question details is like a standard Ask Tom page. Show me the question text, the answer text, any bits and pieces. And finally, an API to answer the question. I know what the answer is, I'm the admin, I come in and I log my answer. That's the entirety of my app. Now, because I've kidnapped our testers, it's a simple task tonight. They need to find the bugs. If they find the bugs and fix my application, then they get to win their freedom. Uh, if you're a Netflix fan, you can think of this as a bit like sort of Squid Game, but it's using the database and Peel SQL instead of that. So for our captive kidnap victims to win their freedom, they need to be able to test my application and find the bugs. Now, normally I would introduce these two testers, but this is a kidnapping metaphor. So we know how kidnapping works. They always then go to the video and they have to hold up a newspaper showing today's date. And they say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I've been kidnapped. So rather than me introduce my two guests tonight on the office hours, I'll now hand over to them and they can introduce themselves. I'll stop my share and they can introduce themselves and then they can take over the session and see how good my application really is. So over to my two victims. Hi. <laughs> that was a, a pretty amazing intro. Uh, so yeah, we, we are cap we are uh, captives. And uh, yeah, uh, Jacek, maybe you want to uh, start and I will take over later. So uh, one thing I really want to say, this is a very big experiment. We, we really didn't practice anything. We didn't look at the code instead of installing it uh, locally to, to uh, my development machine. And that's it. So let's find out what we can make out of this session. Okay. So as our kidnapper has mentioned, um, I'll just start by introducing myself. I don't have any newspapers to say that this is live recording, but it is. Uh, so um, my name is Jacek Gebal. Uh, I'm a one of the authors of UTPO SQL unit testing framework. And uh, mm, well, you might, for those who don't know really what UTPO SQL is, I'll just give a very brief uh, intro. Uh, and then probably Sam will talk a little bit more or actually show it in action. So let me see if I can do that. Uh, so UTPO SQL is. Uh, when you, when you think about, okay, how do I use it? What do I do with it? Well, it's a thing that you can do to test the database, right? Uh, actually, PL SQL or SQL code in the database. And to get started, all you need to do is know the key concepts, which is the, the package specification annotations. So to make your package 
a unit test package, you need to annotate it, you need to test that it, say that it's a test suite and that the, the, the particular procedure is a test procedure. And you can, those are the annotations. It's a dash dash percent. It's like a comment, but with a percent at the start. And then the next thing you need to do is go and implement a test and to actually perform a check on, on your data we use the expectation syntax, which is ut.expect. And then you say, well, what is your actual value and what is it that you expect it to be? And in this case, it's we expect Chuck to equal Chuck. Uh, and there is more than just to equal. That's just one of the examples of possible comparisons. And then uh, eventually, well, then you created your test package, you want to execute it. And to do this, you execute the ut.run and you provide optionally information, what is it that you want to run? If you don't say what you want to run, it will run all of the test packages in your current schema. Uh, so that's it in terms of very brief introduction. Uh, I'll hand it over to Sam. He'll be doing all the heavy lifting today, which is actually implementing those tests. And I'll probably be just like uh, navigating and suggesting what and how we, I think we could be doing. Well, you will have to answer all, all the hard questions. I just need to type. And every time I'm stuck, I just, OK, Jacek, what, what are we going to do? Uh, yeah, a quick uh, introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Samuel. I am uh, working on UTP LSQL since three, three and a half years, I think. And that's also uh, where I met Jacek. And uh, uh, you you might have seen a, a switch from my profile pic to now because I improved a little bit and now A3LPC is the Sith here and I'm just uh, a captive and also uh, slightly turning to the good side of the force. Um, so, but let's hop straight into action here. And the very first thing we want to do is to install UTP LSQL because that's what we are using. And we thought it is so easy to do that, that we could just make it a part of this. Um, I have prepared that because that's always something I'm, I'm struggling with. So I will just copy that over and we'll, we will have a look. It's really just running an SQL script from the latest um, release, which is uh, 3.1.11. And when we, we do that, in that case as uh, sysdba, to make it very easy, it will go on and will start. I think you might have it installed already. I did, I, I thought I, I had it uh, uninstalled. Hmm. Uh, okay, so that's uh, of course the, the great thing that happens, uh, which means we might have the user already. So let's hop into that because we are professionals, right? And uh, actually delete the UT3 uh, user, uh, drop user UT3 cascade. And this is proof folks that we're doing this all live. Yeah. <laughs> It you, very you, much is. You might, you might encounter some problems in the installation now, Sam, because you'd still have public synonyms, but that's we can consider this a success anyway. I hope Connor will yep. forgive us uh, and we still can go free. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, so that looks uh, a lot better. <laughs> yeah. So UTP or SQL is... Uh, it's, it's a lot of different database objects, but they all sit in one schema. And in essence, when when I'm recommending installation of UTP or SQL, I say install it database wise wide, so you have it in one schema, and it's like a framework separate from all the other code. So as Sam was just showing, you know, he dropped the UT3 user, nothing was lost. He just removed the framework, right? So you don't need to worry. Oh, my framework is coexisting with my tests, or it's uh, coexisting with my uh, production code, which is probably not what you want to do. Okay, and we are nearly done. 
Uh, and that's really what I wanted to showcase. It's very, very fast to install that. And we have one different thing that I will just try, which is creating public synonyms and grants because we want uh, the UT3 schema as UT available for all the users in our database. And of course, there are some nuances. You might not be able to do, do that on your database, but there are um, options and they are all uh, described on the UTPLSQL website too. So now we can actually start. And the first thing I would like to do, and that's always what I do when I approach these situations is, let's have a look at our public API of the application that we want to, to test. And we already had an introduction, like this is one part we might want to test. And this is, and this, and, and this is another one. And then we have these also. And the first thing I would like to decide is what is the most critical function of this application? Because I will start probably with that if it's kind of easy to test. And uh, otherwise I will probably, probably look for what is very easy to test. So these are two questions that we can use to approach how we will um, go on. So in my opinion, this is a very, very important thing because it is a, a really fundamental functionality, way more important than these three here because nah, at the end I can provide some, some pre-built admins or something. So mm, maybe let's start with that. That is an excellent um, decision. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I want to do is create a new test suite here. And I work file-based. So um, the only thing I really did with what the uh, Connor provided was to put all the uh, database objects into their own files. And I will do the same with the tests. So I will start with UT ask Tom app pks really no one thing you want to note is probably that you know you, you prefix those with ut but it's not mandatory uh, no. so you can name them however you want so this association of package and body doesn't really need to be one-to-one -one and it doesn't need to be name by name it's just making it easier to understand okay well this test suite is for, is for this functionality yes um Exactly. I always like to uh, prefix them with UT because it makes it very uh, or much easier for me to recognize uh, what, what is what. Um, so we are going to create the first uh, test package here and it really doesn't matter that much at that point what we put in. So just uh, ask Tom Light is our description for our test suite here. And the first thing I would like to do is create new question. And just by adding this test annotation here, I say, okay, this following procedure is in fact a test. So let's compile this and let's start, uh, let's create another file, which is PKB. And I'm lazy, so I often copy things around and just add a couple of things then. As so, let's not implement anything because we want to be very, very um, small in our steps. So, um, compile this one. You can see we compiled it and then compile this one again and we have no compilation errors so far. And what and, I uh, really would, sorry, yeah, just, just hop I, in. Otherwise I will talk all the time. So. 
I know, and I'm the same, so I don't know who's going to do more talking today. <laughs> I'll try to interrupt as much as I can. I noticed there was a question from Torsten about install with trigger, so I just want to answer that quickly. Uh, the with trigger is actually installing the data, uh, UTP or SQL with a database-wide uh, DDL trigger, which allows for UTP or SQL to scan uh, or you know compile UTP or SQL uh, tests while they are compiled by the by the database, and that way it's much faster to start up unit tests, especially when you have, I say, a huge schema with uh, I don't know twenty thousand packages, for example. Okay. So it's a side note. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. No problem. Um, so what I am gonna do is enable. BMS output. Oh, data grip is updating index, indexes. How cool. So I can, yeah, now, now I can enable DBMS output <laughs> because the first thing I really want to do is to check if uh, my first test is really working at all. So what I can do is call ut run and I will get the output of all the tests that we have in this database um uh, uh written to dbms output and we can do the same thing as select from ut run and that we will we will get it as ordinary result set here so same content just in a different way so that's uh more or less the basics and i will now close this area here so we have a little bit more room for coding and also probably um, make this a little bit smaller so what we want to do is test creating a new question right so what we really need is is uh, to call the functionality in the end which is uh, ask tom app and new question it is so and let's go uh email is something so let's just put in some some dummy data first dummy at gmail.com because every everyone is on gmail right uh name is can you remember what the name was is it the name of the question or the name of the question taker i think it is the name of the question taker right um so notify what is notify do you know uh from what i remember it is uh, an indicator whether the person wants to be uh, notified about the answer or you know the question being answered so you can put in some value here it's a bar car i i would assume it must be yes or no but or y n but i'm not sure if there is any restriction and then the question is the question okay. itself right yeah so how do i test in the database for example brilliant question right mm. <laughs> so uh, and and what we can do now is we we just compile this here and then switch back to our console and run it and see what happens and we got some warnings oh this is interesting because that means that um this api we are using is actually committing stuff and that's a little bit sad because now we have actual test data in our actual data that we put in in the database. Uh, but yeah, I think it's really worth noting that UTP or SQL will detect it and it allows you to kind of overcome, well, not overcome, but you know, it will inform you that you have some transaction control in your code uh, because without that, it would automatically manage transactions for you. Uh, and what we need to do now, probably Sam, is uh, make sure that we remove the data that we have inserted. So I would suggest maybe having a look at the table that was populated with 
that test. So like the production code that, uh, what do we have to, questions, questions. right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So here is, here is our thing, right? Uh, and I, yeah, I have, I have a different idea. So let's at least discuss it because I really hate manual data cleanup. <laughs> so oh, maybe, maybe we can do that later, but, but what I would really like is to, to change Connor's thing a little bit and have actually two procedures. One new question that we keep it as it is, and one that doesn't use a transaction or doesn't use a, a commit and roll back mechanic. So make a wrapper around it. So what do, yeah, what do maybe, you think? Maybe let's, maybe let's have a look at that procedure and let's do it just for that procedure itself, right? Okay. Um, my personal take on it is like, I mean, I'm, I'm also uh, trying to follow the same approach, meaning, um, so here we have like an insert and a commit, right? So if, of course, it's a very trivial code, right? So it's, it's very, it's just an insert. It doesn't have any, any logic in it, but you might have, um, if, your, if your procedure is a bit more complex, it's, it makes much more sense because now it's gonna be like the, the declaration of the procedure is longer than the body, right? <laughs> uh, and we will kind of duplicate it again to isolate the transaction control. But one of the things, like if, if you look at that, one of the things I see is, it's something that I quite often see anyways, is it's actually partial transaction control here, which we could also have a look at because like, I'm not sure if we're allowed to modify the tested code. I would ask, probably need to ask our kidnapper. Of um, course, you can, you can modify away. I have no problems with you taking transaction control out because uh, that actually probably makes it more flexible in the sense that we could run it standalone in the database or from a calling application. So feel free to take that out. Yeah, so you see, one of the things uh, that I see here, even if we would be to leave that transaction control is that it's only partial transaction control. I mean, it, there is commit, so we will succeed. If, if everything goes well, there is a commit and the transaction is finished. But if anything goes wrong, um, well, it's a single insert, so it doesn't really matter. But normally you would say, well, exception when, let's say some, some sort of error or exception when others, roll back so that then you have a full picture of transaction control what you know what's going to happen if everything is go well and you know what's going to happen if uh, if the transaction fails right so it's not going to be uncommitted or you know you will you will not leave that procedure with an open transaction so to say okay um so i would in in, in that specific case i would really like to just remove the commit here because Connor said he was okay with, with us changing the behavior here. We could always, just if, if this is a more complex situation, we could always duplicate the procedure, give it a new name and make the transaction control a wrapper. And that's one very important thing. Testing is not about we, the, the application code is set in stone. Testing is about exploring the code and see, okay, how can we how can we get to a testable state? And one thing that really, really helps us is to remove transaction control uh, in the units that we are testing. Oh, that's the first thing that I will be removing. And let's you go probably back to need our- to, You probably need to remove that record as well, yeah. right? If you want. We need- from questions where name A3LPC. And let's also do a commit here. We don't have it anymore. And now let's run the test again. And yeah, okay. So now it runs. And if we look into our questions, Nothing, nothing has happened because uh, UTPLSQL has automatically rolled back all the things that we have done, which is pretty cool. Well, um, actually, also, yeah. yeah. 
go, go actually it is it is uh, rolling back for each and every test so that's even cooler because you might say well you know i start my tests and it executes everything and then it does the rollback at the end but actually it is performing a partial rollback or rollback to save point after every test so that every test is isolated from one another yeah so let's get back uh, to our test code so what we really would like to assure is that we have some data in the questions table and we we already tested that manually right so let's let's do it in an automatic way so we can run it over and over again and one one very simple way to do this would be um oh, come on l count integer and let's say select count into l count from questions where um, name is a3lpc and then say okay ut expect l count to equal one but this is a very very simple test and I will do one thing now because I don't like switching back and forth. I will now leverage a plugin inside data grip um, that hopefully will run all my tests here. And yeah, it, it does exactly that. So I will show this very quickly. This is a runner as we know it from other um, from, from other languages like Java, etc. And it will pick up all the tests um, inside the, the code base or inside the database in that case and, and display it in a little better way. So I can just go here and uh, type uh, control F5 and it will be rerun. Very, very handy, especially when we work in very small iterations. Um, and so by the way, is, if you're using... Yeah. Sorry, by the way, if you're using SQL Developer, you can also, like there's also a plugin for that. So it's not like, oh, you have to go and get data grip to use it, whether it's SQL Developer or Toad, there are ex like Toad supports you, the new version of UTPO SQL. Uh, so it's integrating with it and uh, uh, the SQL Developer, which is also free, uh, can uh, has a plugin created by uh, Philip Salzberg uh, that integrates nicely. Yeah. Um, so we we now made sure we have something in there, and maybe we want to be a bit more sure what what is going on, right? Um, so what we could do instead is, for example, not use count here, but use the whole row, and then we can check the individual columns. So I think that that actually is a very good idea, Sam, because if uh, if you actually uh, want to uh, compare the data, like uh, like if you want to test a procedure, testing that the record was inserted is, in my opinion, definitely not enough. I've seen a lot of tests that were like that and that they don't prevent bugs in your code. Uh, so what you really want to do is make sure that you're comparing the actual data and making sure uh, that the data is correct. And uh, actually, I would also uh, probably, uh, my favorite approach is actually to use uh, cursors to compare the data. I don't know if you were planning yes. to go to that, Sam. Yes, we can also use cursors, of, of course. And uh, maybe, maybe we demonstrate it. So we run our test again. And come on, yeah. So it still uh, works. So there is one ugly thing if we make our test fail now. Um, if we run it, it will result in an error instead of of a failed test. So and this is this is was was uh, what Jacek is uh, suggesting. 
we can do it in a different way and then we will not run into an exception but uh, in a kind or in a failed test and what we can use then is to say okay uh, we have two cursors c actual this ref cursor and we have c expected or expect this ref cursor and let's first create the actual cursor which is really select from questions where name is a 3 lpc one because we still want to demonstrate that the test is failing so op open c actual four and then what we need is another cursor expect for well, and we can say okay what do we expect we expect for example dummy gmail.com as email like 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 this from dual then we can change our expectation to be c actual should equal c expect so and what then happens Du, 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 du. Hmm. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, I maybe you think your SQL has a bug. <laughs> I, think, I think we have a bug in UTP or SQL. <laughs> ah, cool. So I, yeah. I shouldn't have uh, uh, updated to the latest uh, version then. But, but there was no changes there in that in that release. I actually have to look at that. Why okay. is that happening? There should be no error, really. So, uh, is that the mismatch hmm. of columns you've got? No, UTP SQL handles nicely okay. mismatch of columns, and it will report you the columns that are not matching. Uh, yeah, and in this case, there is no data in the actual. Yeah, maybe hmm. it has something to do with the C lob or something. I don't Maybe know. Maybe it's the C lob, but it should also be allowed for a C lob comparison. Okay, interesting. Uh, I'll need to make a note, something it, to investigate. Was it LPC? <laughs> was it LPC one or LPC? Uh, LPC. That's exactly what it yeah, was. Yeah, we we, so, we inserted it with uh, LPC, and that's a very good point, uh, Connor. Because what we really want to do in these situations is something like that, uh, like. LC for local constant, uh, test name, constant, virtual to whatever is a three LPC. And then really use these things here because then it gets very obvi obvious what we are doing. And now our yeah. test is is uh, working again. Uh, I'm really surprised that to see that failure, but well, it happens. Um, so maybe you could add a name as a second column to the select statement, yep. to the actual, and let's see what will happen, or or to the expected, whatever. Yeah, I, I can do both. So I can add name here. Just wanted to show you what it actually what it will yeah. act what will actually happen. So you see that there is a conium mismatch now, right? So it's saying, well, there is a conium, right? That is not expected in because our expected data set doesn't have that conium, right? So this is one of the things like I, I think we wanted to achieve with select star, but it failed, uh, which is showing, well, you know, select star is actually not so bad when you're doing testing, because what you can compare is all of the columns of your data set, right? So when your data set is changing, let's say you added a new column to the table, right? You might actually want your tests to fail. You want to say, well, well, there is a new column. What happened? What about the tests for that new column, right? So uh, that way your, your tests are more robust because you're covering the whole set of columns. Whereas if you specify them one by one, you add a new conium, 
well, that won't be covered, right? When you remove Aconium, that will be covered because the tests won't compile. But select star in this regard is really nice and handy way of saying, well, I want to have all of the coniums and I want to make sure that my tests are testing all of the coniums. And UTP or SQL should support club, so I need to look into that and we'll definitely do that after this session, well, sometime after this session. Yeah, and this is something that, that happens all the time when you are really are testing, um, your expectations get challenged because you, you suddenly experience some things that, ah, Don't, don't match your mental model of what should happen. And that, that's a very huge benefit of, of writing tests in that way. So um, to solve our problem here, we can now uh, use LC test name as name. Then our expectation and actual value should be the same again. So I really wonder about that that notify thing right because we didn't we didn't add anything here we passed null and it worked and i am really curious what we will get here so what we can do is we expect expect this to stay null i guess as voucher of whatever kind uh can you remember what it was i can also look it up Uh, no, I don't remember. Sorry. It's Vacha to one. Yeah. Okay. As notify. So I'm curious what we will get. Okay. It still stays null. So this might be either expected or not at all. Um, uh. so Did, did you change the notify actually in the setup for the test? No, I, I kept it null. So we, we actually okay. proved that null is a valid input, right? Yes. So it gets passed to the to the data table, which which is okay. Um, so what we can of course try out is what is if we pass y here? Do we also get y back? And of course I can remove the cast then yeah it's 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 okay so so why seems to work here and probably oh let's let's see if that changes if we say n and still have our expectation yes so well that that works that works pretty nicely um, if we have it say yes, then it will be yes. If we say it is no, then it is no. And there are other things we could test, for example, um, what happens with upper lowercase handling? Okay. I think we just detected either a feature or a bug. I'm not sure. <laughs> that's a, that's a very that's a very good point, Sam. Because <laughs> one of the one of the biggest lessons of my life is, and, and many discussions, you know, we say, well, it's a bug. No, it's actually a feature, right? And one of the things I've learned is, well, actually, it's not up to me as an engineer to decide if something is a bug or a feature. Because all of those things that we consider features or bugs are should be driven from expectations or requirements from the business, right? Or from the users. So in case of let's say Connor being the owner of Ask Tom Light, I would ask Connor, should there be uh, should the, all the emails be stored in lowercase? Is that a, a valid requirement? And, and and if so, then we should actually have a test for it. Um, yes, that is that is correct. In in the uh, the DDL that I sent over to you, uh, there's actually a trigger that forces all emails to lowercase, um, and that, that's that sort of that common technique of such that we can maybe at one stage one day uh, add uniqueness or email checks, etc. So all all emails are forced to lowercase in this in this schema. Okay, 
That's pretty so cool because we 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 figured out one requirement that we didn't know up front. Um, and so my approach. Want to implement it? Want yeah, to but but not in this approach? test, to be honest, because this is like our 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 high level test that kind of uh, uh, checks the whole the the whole functionality. So what what I could do, of course, I could put in here a, a, an uppercase dummy and expect here a lowercase dummy. So then we have a kind of regression test. So if we, for example, lose that trigger that does it, our test will fail, but it's not very helpful to have this high level test fail. Would you agree, Jacek? Um, yes, because in that case, uh, you actually, like your test is losing its, uh, its function i mean if it's a high level test it should, should should just test well i can create a new question without any details about it like okay because now you're testing two things you say well i can create a new question oh and by the way uh, uh i'm also testing that the email is is lower cased right so it's changed to lower case and actually that's a separate function a separate feature or a separate requirement and i would say well let's just assume you know absolutely vanilla scenario like of exactly the input data that we want without an exposing any extra features and then we should have a separate test maybe just focusing on the email address and say well what if i uh, you know if i put in an uppercase email it should it should actually become a lowercase email and that's a separate test case okay so do we want to implement these these test cases around email or do we want to tackle another topic? Because I think I, at this point we need to decide due to time constraints. Yes, I think we could. Uh, what we could do is actually uh, try that club and see if, if we can actually tackle that. Uh, if you could explicitly maybe add that club column which is, oh, it's actually question, uh, right? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. And see if it will still fail. We're kind of now testing two things at the same time, which is testing the framework and testing uh, Connor's uh, Asktom Lite uh, library. No, uh, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Now that's better. So you see, it actually works. So that error that you saw before must have been for some other reason, which I will investigate. But we can actually test this input as well, right? And you see, or I think it's a nice, nice feature of uh, UTPO SQL. It is actually strong typed. So well, if you're expecting club, you should say that you're expecting club in your cursor rather than say well. If it looks like a string, it is a string, which is kind of you know duct taping, uh, typing, and uh, duck typing, and then therefore it's you know if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. Uh, so UTPO SQL will detect data type changes even in your columns to some extent, right? So it will say it's a number, not a string, and it's a string, not a number. It's a date, not a number, or club and varchar. Okay. So I wonder, do we want to tackle one other thing? For example, here, question details, because we are now able to create a question at least, right? Or maybe questions for customers. I don't know what that thing is doing. I'm really curious. Um, so would you agree that we try try uh, tackling another another function here? Certainly, pick whatever. Yeah, you I like. think that makes sense. Then let's start with a test. Uh, how is it called? Questions for customer. That one sounds cool. Questions for customer. And when when I start investigating, I don't mind very much what my my test names are when i have a better understanding then i will split my initial test into several very specific ones that 
as we as we discussed before, describe what we are already uh, what we are actually expecting. So this is just one one tip from my side when we start investigating. This is not the end. It's really just the beginning. <laughs> that what what we are doing here. Uh, so let's have this as a new thing here. So, oh, and what we want to have now is some uh, a range because we need a question. Um, and that means we, we need to control what we want to test. And one thing we could do is to say, okay, we copy this and use the function that we already validated and verified as a range all right so we could now change the lc test name to a global constant so we have it throughout the test package and then i would even rename it to gc test name like global constant so now we should have a test uh, a question available and then we can actually act and test our functionality. Tom app is a question for customer. So we want the dummy email here and we learned that this will always be lowercase. And one question I have here is where's the output? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. We <laughs> probably need to investigate investigate the code to see what actually what it's actually doing. Yeah, because it's a procedure, it doesn't return anything. So what am I going to test here at all? So let's look into the code here question for customer mm. so this is oh that is really nice <laughs> it is providing the output of well the ui is through dbms output so to say in this case right so so the outputs of this code go to dbms output um, and in general, I think it's not the best thing to do. Well, it's, it's I think, highly unrecommended to use DBMS output in your production code. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what we should be using in the first place. But since we're kind of given this to be tested, we could try to test the contents that is passed to DBMS output. And certainly in a real life production system, that would probably be just returning either a ref cursor of the output, or yeah. it might be calling, for example, um, HTTP if it was an Apex application. But either way, yeah, feel, feel free to modify as you go. This was purely so it could keep it nice and self-contained. Yeah, but I, I find it a nice example because it showcases in the end, it doesn't matter what or, or in, in which form the output occurs. We still have input and output, and that is what we want to, to test and what we want to check for. So if we have an option to get that output, we can test it. And uh, maybe, Jacek, you need to guide me because I never so far <laughs> tested DBM as output. Okay. If you start <laughs> with... Uh... Maybe get you know, like writing uh, DBMS output get lines, right? Uh, get lines. You see, wait, it has uh, uh, it has DBMS output lines array or DBMS output char array. I would say that using DBMS output lines array is better because that's a schema level type, whereas DBMS output dot char array is a package level type. And actually schema level types are 
support it in UTP or SQL testing. So you could test okay. it straight through uh, expectations. Okay, so we need some some uh, lines here, right? Yes. DBMS. Uh, DBMS lines. Are... Yes, and you probably need both expected and actual, right? But let's start with the expected. Now, get lines with has lines, but I think it has a one more argument. Yeah. Uh, uh, where where is it here? Uh, num lines. Number lines. Num lines. It's an interesting construct in a DBMS output. You must say how many. Actually, it's an in out or or something. So I you say I want to get. It definitely is an out parameter, so it needs to be a variable, but I'm not sure if it doesn't say, well, get me 10 lines. And actually the, the value that you get back, it says, well, I gave you five lines because it, there were only five lines in the, the buffer, right? So it's I think it's an in out. So you could try that uh, as a variable and let's say, well, we expect no more than a thousand lines, right? So okay, you, you need, need, another, you need okay, another can... variable. We you can't enough. do it like this. Yes. Okay. So and it will be a variable that will be initialized as, let's say, 1,000, right? So you say, give me up to 1,000 lines at a time. Uh, and yeah, and then you can even do an expectation on the number of lines. Say, well, we want just one line, right? So the okay, L so num lines should be one. Oh, let's see what it is, right? <laughs> yes. Equal. Let's let's make an assumption here. And you see it automatically picked up uh, my new test here, which is very nice. And it, it seems to be actually one. And I'm pretty surprised. So this <laughs> worked, worked right away, which, which is cool. Um, and also a little bit scary because everything at uh, something runs at the first time. I'm always a little bit concerned because eh, maybe I'm missing something. So I will make a very, very quick change and see. Yeah. Okay. So, so my test is generally working and this is really something you want to do. Um, make sure that your test is actually failing. Okay. Um, so we have L lines. What, 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 what is that thing? Do you know it? Can I, can I just expect it with, with something? You can do UT expect and because it's, um, uh, we can't really, uh, do expectations on any type that exists because every database will have a different type. Right, and they different yeah. set of types. Those could be custom types, right? So instead of this, what you need to do is you need to write wrap that those lines into any data. So uh, it's called not uni, UT any data. It's a, any data type, which is Oracle built-in type, and you need to uh, do uh, any data dot convert collection. Convert collection exactly, uh, okay. and that way, okay. yes, and that way. Uh, your uh, and then you say that this will you expect this for example to be empty and that that will say well I expect the, the lines to be an empty array. Uh, okay, let's let's try it out. Okay. Ah, and I see I get something here. This is cool. So it's actually uh, returning data in the format of you know, lines array and each line has a text inside, right? And you get an ID, a date, uh, probably, is it a date? I think it's a date. It's very strange, yes. So there is some sort of date and the user and that's it. Interesting. So it okay, probably so should, uh, I, think, I think this functionality is supposed to give you a list of questions, all the questions that a user has asked. Uh, so yes. if you would have more than one question for a user, um, because you're passing the email address, so the user is identified by email address, right? Now I'm wondering, 
what if you pass email address once upper, once lower? Is it case sensitive or not? Probably shouldn't be, right? Because your persisting data in, in lower case always. So if you're asking for an uppercase user uh, email, will it still work or not? Um, so, so we we are still in a in a failing test uh, scenario right now, right? Um, so maybe we want to solve this first and make it an actually uh, running test because at the moment we are just looking here, but nah, what we really want to do is make sure we get something here. So could we, for example, say um, to be like, is that something no. we can use with the convert collection? No? No, because to be like actually is uh, using a like operator and you cannot uh, perform a like operator on collections, right? You can use to contain, right? Or you can use to uh, equal, right? So and to, to contain. contain means it should contain uh, a record, right? Uh, and it says, well, if we have, a, let's say, a collection of 100 records, and you can use that for cursors as well. Say if you have a, a, a cursor with 100 rows, you can say, oh, I expect this to contain that row, right? Or I expect this collection to contain a, a subset of that collection, right? So in this case, really, what you can do is say, I expect this collection to contain another collection of the same type, right? Okay. Um, so you, so you, you can still, you can only compare the same data types really. So you can okay, on, so, only compare so, uh, DBMS output lines array to DBMS output lines array. L lines expect would then be DBMS output lines array. DBMS put lines array probably, and with, then with, we, with a string, yeah. Yeah, so let me get this a little bit more. And this is becoming quite tricky, to be honest. This, this code is hard to test because it is actually performing, if, if you could open the production code, Oh yeah, you can you can just type it in, right? And say, well, this is what we expect. If you're building like a a regression suite for uh, existing functionality, if you assume that this is working correctly, right? Then you're actually assuming that this is working correctly. Yes. But yes. is it? But is it right? Yeah. Is we, this what we, we expect? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But at least. We we would get to a state where we know. Okay, the the status quo is now regression safe to some extent. And this is actually from my uh, experience, it's something that often happens when you deal with legacy code because you never know, is this real? So the first step will be, okay, just just have a, have a snapshot of this functionality like that. Uh, so what it would be now, again, any data, Convert collection is the right. Yep. So this is really absolute new land for me too. Hmm. <laughs> I was Quite. sure you know all the functionalities <laughs> of UTP and SQL. <laughs> no, I did not. Uh, and now we have two rows. How is that possible? Oh. What do we have inside lines array? Interesting. So there is 46. Hmm. Interesting. But no, no, was expected to contain. Yeah, and very interesting, to be honest. And I don't know what, how is that even possible? Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I didn't play much with testing DBMS output, to be honest. So I don't know what's happening under the hood here. So Connor, I must say you beat us today because you gave us something that's 
incredibly hard to test, even though it is a very simple code, right? First of all, it's DBMS output. So, well, you shouldn't be using DBMS output, right? And then, well, there is this concatenated text and it contains IDs, right? Um, so, in essence, instead of testing through API, as you did, Sam, in, like, in your uh, arrange part, right? So, in your arrange part, you're using an API to set up the data, which is actually brilliant because that's what I also recommend. If you have a nice set of APIs, like why why not use those APIs to test you know, the flow, right? So first you say, well, I can ask a question, but then you say, well, I can ask a question and see the answer or I can see the question, right? And so you build up more and more uh, cohesive and comprehensive tests that don't care about table structures that much, right? In a sense, you could rename the tables, you can add columns, drop columns, but the API still works if, if the API is your contact point with the outside world. But in this case, because of how the questions for customers are built, right, you're actually getting an ID that you don't really see through API uh, when you're setting the data up. What you probably would have to do is either strip off that ID when you're checking the expected data, say, well, I don't know what the ID is, so my test cannot assume it is gonna be 46 all the time. Uh, and uh, the other thing is uh, you probably uh, want to make sure that when you're set, well, the other way is like set up the data with predefined ID. But again, yeah. I think uh, the, the Connor used identity columns in the, table script, so maybe we couldn't really hard code or force an ID yeah. into the table. So that was the reason why I started with the test name and tried to make that relatively unique. Um, another thing would be check for another unique field that you can use of as a kind of ID, which would then be the, the email address. Um, so Connor, how, how much time do we have? Because one, one thing is very obvious. When yeah. you're approaching a legacy code base in that way, it's totally possible to do that, but it will probably, even for such a small application, need some time. And it would very much help if we already had some, some basic tests that we could expand on. And it also shows that it's probably not the most effective way to detect bugs. Oh, I have to um, admit, like I'm, I'm uh, blown away by just watching you use the IDE and watching the amount of methods that just pop out of thin air un under UTP or SQL. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. There was a comment in the chat about, oh, yeah, we could just, yeah, you could just write your own test from scratch yourself. But like, I think. You know, I think you've demonstrated pretty well tonight that that would be a, just an infinitely complicated affair compared to what you've done here. Um, I'm going to seize the screen back off you. One moment. So, one more. Sorry. Sorry, Jakub, on. you go. Yeah, it's, we 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 still just scratched the surface, to be honest, because like that's just a, a glimpse of you know what you could do with UTP or SQL, and uh, again, like. The challenge that you presented us with, even though it might seem simple, you know, if you're looking blindly into something without like spending time to really get to understand what the code is doing, how it works, and uh, understanding the context, like the business requirements and, and whatnot, well, we, we've just proven it's not simple. Well, it's not I'm, easy. I'm, I'm still just super impressed in the sense that you can just you know, so easily put together routines that test the API. Um, being a dinosaur as I am myself, I'm, you know, I end up with like 37,000 files running some in VS Code, some in Notepad, some in TextPad, some in SQL Developer, three quarters of them are in Git, the rest aren't, yeah, and I'm just a mess. So seeing that discipline and that structure uh, is, uh, I'm blown away. So, uh, I'll, I'll give you a winning pass, a winning pass. I'll, I'll let you all uh, uh, make, an, make an exit from this, this uh, PL SQL version of, of Squid Game. Let me stop my screen share. Um, we've run a little bit over time and I have to admit, I would, um, I would happily just sit here and watch you guys use the IDE uh, and just, yeah, get just sponge the uh, education off you just like that. But 
unfortunately, uh, we only allow hour slots for office hours because I think there's another Apex office hours underway now, which is why our people are desperate to, to move on to the next one. All I can say is, gentlemen, thank you so much for giving up your knowledge and your time. Um, it's just uh, sort of just scratching the surface of the amazing power of, of UTPL SQL. Stephen Feuerstein was in the chat earlier and he was just going, man, this is not the UTPL SQL I used to know. And it's true, it's, the, the evolution has been absolutely breathtaking. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, hopefully um, I'd love to have you back again in the new year and we'll, and we'll organize some other things if we can, if, if you're amenable. Absolutely. Uh, Thanks for having cool. us, Connor. Very cool. Uh, one, one comment. I will definitely spend some time creating a test suite for this because it's really something I enjoy doing. And maybe, uh, Jacek, we will even do it together or do it. you do one part and I do one part. There is a, a repository on Git and uh, I think I will I will share it in the in the wrap up of of this session or, or something. That's something you need to say, Kana. But so I think if, it would be if, very very cool if you have it. Um, in fact, you sent me the link. I'll 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 yeah. post. I'll put a blog post when we publish this as a video, and um, I'll put a blog post together to um, let people see the repository as well. I definitely okay. want to have a look at the bug you, uh, we saw in in UTP or SQL. So that's gonna be my uh, homework <laughs> for today. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. And thank you for attendees for attending office hours. And yeah, we'll try squeezing office hours in next month as well, even though it's just before Christmas, we might just do a free form Q and A or something. We'll see how we go. We'll see what comes up on the question queue. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, gentlemen. And we'll see you next month in office hours. Bye thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye bye.